podcasting. Bring up the participants. So I think when they go to the app, they'll now see this starting and we'll see us in our little in our little bubbles waiting for them to join us. We usually get a couple of nice, like really early birds. And then right around like 725, we'll get a few more. But it's been very cool seeing people join from across the world in this. We have a guy all the way from New Zealand with beds that has been coming to some of these too. Uh, Dick, you're on mute. If you hit the space bar on your computer, it'll take you off mute. That's the easy way to do it. Let's see. There you there go. go. Yeah, okay. I mean, th this timing must be tough for people from Europe because it's six hours later, Central European time. Right. Even so they can also join at, they can come and see the recording later too for those folks. So, but yeah, that is the middle of the night. I think somebody met, sent me an email the other day and said, hey, I, I work and this is at midnight. Is this going to be up later? And I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> It's fun. Got a couple people joining us. Hello, Fran again, and Kelly Kopish, our awesome technology person. She's just checking in to make sure everything's working, I guess. But good to see Fran again. There is a chat here, too. Let's turn that on. <laughs> Fran says hello again. I think I've seen Fran at every one of these Fed sessions. She's one of our amazing community members and a member of our steering committee as well. So she's really great. Oh, Ying is here. Ying is in China. She's joining us from there. I think that's about a 12 hour. Is that a 12 hour difference from here in China? I think it is. It must be early in the morning for her. So hello everybody, welcome. We're just gonna, you know, let everybody join us and in a few minutes we'll be starting the session. I'm just kind of hanging out. excited. This is our second week of Summit and we've had a lot of great presentations and things going on. It's been very busy. <laughs> very, very busy. There we go, we've got some people joining us now. Hi Danielle, hi Trisha, hi Christopher. Hello everybody, good to see you again. Abby's here, Michelle. I'm starting to get very familiar with, these, with the names of these people and hopefully I get to meet you one day. For those I haven't met already. Very, very exciting.
questions? We got a couple more minutes. Oh, there's somebody I haven't seen, I don't think yet. Hello, Debbie, nice to see you. I don't know how to say your last name, so I'm not going to, to butcher it, but it's very nice to see you. Jackie. This is great, I love seeing new people. Wonderful. There's Bridget, Deborah. Great. Got just about another minute. Are you guys still hearing a little bit of feedback when I talk? No? Okay, good. Just on my end. Awesome. So welcome everybody, we'll get started in just a, just a minute. One thing about the full screen presentation is I can't actually see what time it is without looking at my phone or my watch. But that's okay. I think it's 7.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Katie Wright. I'm the director of the Beds Movement, a division of the Markin Foundation. I also have Deborah Goodman with, here, with us here tonight, who's going to be managing the chat box, and she just waved at you. So um, if you put any chats in the chat box, she will be there to respond and give resources where needed. Um, we are very, very excited to have you join us tonight in the International E3 Summit which is powered by the Marfan Foundation and our partners in Europe at the CERN, as well as our division, the Low East Deep Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS movement. We are very, very thrilled. This is our second week and it has been quite a ride and we're very excited to be able to bring this to you. Um, we also want to thank you for helping us make history. We currently have nearly 2,700 registrants from 72 countries across the world. And not only are we present across the world, but we are representing several different conditions. And of course, we know we're here tonight for people with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and it's very exciting to see people join us from everywhere. We also have over 300 medical professionals registered for the E3 Summit, which we also find very incredible. So thank you for, for helping us make history in these few weeks here. Uh, we also would like to thank our presenting sponsors before we begin, Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Communications Construction. And we do want to let you know before we get started that the E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic aortic and vascular conditions. As such, opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or the CERN. If you do have questions or need clarification about differences in opinions between session speakers, feel free to contact us at our help center, marfan.org slash E3 ask. And we'd also like to remind you, if you would, after this session is over, if you could rate this session and in the Whova app, right where the arrow is, where it says rate, that's where you can keep the survey and let us know how we did tonight. Before we go on to the presentation, I do want to introduce Dr. Heidi Connolly and Dr. Richard Devereaux, who are here tonight to answer your questions and, and prepare a presentation as well. So I'm gonna give you both an opportunity to say hello to everybody. And Heidi, you can go first if you'd like. Hi everybody, it's uh, great to be a part of this and I uh, uh, congratulate Katie and the Marfan Foundation, Lois Dietz Foundation, et cetera, um, on this incredible, um, and of course the VEDS movement um, on this incredible um, success so far, so. 
Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Devereux, uh, do you want to I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be included in this program. It's a, a spectacular achievement, and uh, my, I've had a longstanding involvement with the Marfan syndrome and multiple other genetic aortopathies, uh, take care of some hundreds of patients and have been involved in research in this area. So I'm sure both Dr. Connolly and I would be happy to answer questions that don't, aren't totally focused on uh, the, you know, imaging uh, issues that, uh, you know, are the, the, the advertised uh, topic of this session, but we, we both have broad experience and happy to try to take on any questions at all. Thank you both. I'm very excited to have you both here tonight and bringing your expertise to this community. So um, thank you again. And I think we will go ahead and put our videos on off now and put ourselves on mute so that we can focus on the presentation that Dr. Devereaux prepared. And then we will come back to our Q&A. If you have any questions during this presentation, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A, uh, which is a separate box from the chat box. If you put your questions in the chat box, we might not get to them. So please make sure to put them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. And we will go ahead and play the presentation. My name is Dr. Richard Devereaux. I'm from Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Um, and I'll be joined, we'll be joined in a while by Dr. Heidi Connolly from the Mayo Clinic during the question and answer session. I'm honored to have the opportunity uh, to join this uh, innovative symposium and to uh, talk with you this evening on the topic of what are the best imaging modalities for VEDS uh, patients. Uh, now, one, I'd uh, like to discuss, uh, make three uh, points, uh, and I'll go through details about them uh, during the course of this discussion. The first uh, is that, as uh, many or all of you know, uh, vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome can involve a wide variety of different arteries in the body. Uh, this slide is from a large number of patients who have diagnosis based on collagen testing in Peter Byers' laboratory at the University of Washington, uh, showing that uh, from a few percent to as many as 20 percent of patients in a, this large series had involvement of the aorta and the abdomen or chest of uh, branch arteries to the intestines uh, in the abdomen of arteries in the neck or head, arteries to the lower extremity or arteries uh, to the heart. Uh, if we look at a different series of uh, patients uh, from uh, a number of centers in the United States uh, who came to these centers with suspicion of vascular disease, we see a slightly different distribution, but the same areas, the aorta, arteries to the intestines, arteries to the head and brain, the branch arteries uh, to the legs and the arteries to the kidneys. And to uh, go to a different and non-overlapping population followed in Paris uh, among 144 patients, nearly 20% had aortic uh, the involvement of the aorta or its branch arteries. Uh, somewhat smaller numbers had uh, involvement of arteries uh, going to the, to the brain and, uh, and or going to the legs. So there's a wide dispersion of different arteries that need to be imaged. Now let's turn to the possible imaging methods. The traditional one that has been around uh, for many decades is doing invasive angiograms where a catheter, that's a hollow tube, is uh, placed into an artery peripherally and advanced to the region that is interest, of interest. Uh, this is widely available and a great deal is known about it, but it does 
carry a risk of causing a dissection or rush, rupture of fragile vessels, and that is obviously a consideration in patients with VEDS. Uh, this uh, shows the slide shows two things. One uh, is these are a series of invasive angiograms where a catheter has been advanced into an artery and then dye is injected, which makes the vessels show up. The first thing it shows is that there uh, is a uh, unusual uh, location pocket of dye. This is a view through the right side of the chest, and there's an unusual pocket of dye reflecting an aneurysm in a small artery. Uh, and then as one goes along, a procedure is done to block off this aneurysm by what they call embolization. At the end of this procedure, in the lower right-hand corner, one sees a little bit of an odd uh, blotch of dye over here. Uh, after this, the patient began to develop back pain, and so they took additional pictures here in uh, segment A of this uh, view. One sees a pocket of dye just hanging up uh, uh, to the left side of the spinal cord. This is an area where there really shouldn't be a collection of dye. So they took the patient uh, to a CAT scan, computed tomographic scan uh, laboratory, and did images that are shown in B uh, through F. Uh, and these are pictures looking at the patient as you would from the front with the spinal cord here, left side, right side here. And the aorta should be filled up with dye and a straight tube here with relatively thin walls. You can see the walls are thick in this front view and here in a side view they're much thicker. This is a, a clot or un dye or blood without dye in part of the aorta and this is the narrow channel after there's been a dissection of the aorta that is likely to have been caused by the catheter used for the prior uh, intervention. And these other pictures show that this uh, dissection also went through the aortic arch. This is looking from the top of the body down and uh, went into the, also in the descending aorta. So we use uh, invasive angiography very carefully in centers that are used to dealing with patients with uh, genetic cardiovascular diseases in very expert hands it can be done with relatively high safety, but we don't use it willy-nilly. The technique that is most widely used uh, in uh, patients suspected of having acute uh, complications of vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or other genetic arterial diseases is computed tomographic angiography, or CTA. It is widely available. It's done uh, adequately in most even small hospitals or outpatient radiology offices. It can visualize all arteries and can detect even minimal leakage of blood from arteries outside of arteries due to dissection or rupture. So these are very powerful advantages. However, it requires x-ray dye that sometimes causes allergic reactions or can cause uh, problems with the kidney and involves radiation uh, that uh, can, with me if one has a, a CAT scans again and again over many years, lead to a small but measurable risk of cancer. Uh, this is just, I'll go through a few slides to show some of the variety of different uh, uh, areas where patients with VEDS uh, can uh, develop aneurysms and potentially have, uh, uh, have rupture. This is an ar showing the artery to the spleen, uh, and it's a very curly Q uh, vessel. The spleen is uh, distorted by this, this dark uh, area is showing a uh, area of blood clot uh, and uh, particularly uh, going outside of the spleen up in, in, in this area. 
Uh, here uh, we're looking at uh, a CT scan of a artery going to the head. Uh, you may appreciate it better on the right-hand side, uh, and the artery comes up here, and you can see that there uh, is dye there and dye there and a layer in between. So this is a dissection uh, in a carotid artery uh, that would be seen on the uh, this uh, three-dimensional view over here. This should be a single artery coming up here. You can see it has a median uh, divider due to the dissection. Uh, so this is an example of what a CT scan can see there. In another patient, uh, again, a 3D rendering here. The carotid artery comes up, it branches, and then there's a blob where uh, the blood had leaked out, uh, uh, causing a large aneurysm or potentially a pseudo aneurysm where there's a clot uh, that the, the clot itself uh, prevents the blood from seeping out further. Uh, here's a view in the abdomen. Uh, again, here's spine and ribs on the left hand in the left hand image uh, showing both kidneys uh, and the artery going up towards the liver, which is not uh, visualized in these pictures, uh, has a, uh, a large blob of, of blood that's contained uh, within an outer sac of, of kind of a scab, and that's shown here. And then if we look at the area of the left kidney, you can see that there are several different areas of uh, enlargement. Uh, and this is another view in a different patient, looking at the abdominal aorta, which looks fine, and the artery here going to the liver uh, has a bulge, which is an aneurysm in what's called the celiac axis. Uh, this is another view uh, in a uh, patient uh, with Ehlers, vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who had had a graft put into the abdominal aorta uh, by a transcatheter technique. Uh, and this is a very attractive technique for doing interventions without needing to open up the body, but in people with genetic uh, arterial diseases uh, has its potential risks. So on the right-hand side here, we can see some of these little these dots are some of the wire mesh of the stent of the graft, and, and that's this is about the same width as the aorta, a little bit higher up, so that's okay. But going down in the abdomen, one sees a very wide uh, area that is a mixture of clot and some dye, uh, blood containing dye that has gotten outside of the uh, of the graft and the graft should be somewhere in the range of two and a half to three centimeters in width. This is over seven centimeters so this is showing leakage and this is a, a view from the side in the same patient showing the graft coming down and then this large area of uh, uh, clot and blood with dye in it outside of the graft. And the graft is actually squeezed. It should be this width all along, but it's squeezed from front to back to being narrow so that uh, we know that there's a risk of complications like this with leaks occurring with these grafts put in by catheter-based techniques. Now, another uh, set of techniques that are uh, often of value for looking at arteries in some areas of the body are ultrasound techniques. Echocardiograms can look at the heart and the aorta near the heart, uh, and sometimes uh, in our laboratory and some other major centers in North America, Europe, and elsewhere, uh, look at other segments of the aorta. Uh, abdominal ultrasounds and carotid ultrasounds can visualize uh, arteries, the abdominal aorta, some of its branches, and the carotid arteries quite well in many people. This is also a very widely available method, and it's a standard method for visualizing these areas. However, uh, it's frequently hard to see uh, the vessel 
levels of interest if they lie behind ribs or lungs or air in the intestine. So this also has limitations. This is a view from our center in a patient with vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who had a aorta that was uh, the top of the, the, this is showing a picture of the heart, the main pumping chamber of the heart's over here. This is the aortic root in ascending aorta and uh, had a diameter of about three and a half centimeters or so, which would have been at or slightly above the top normal range. These are centimeter markers. Uh, she didn't come back for a number of years until she was pregnant and then came back and had a 4.7 centimeter uh, aortic aneurysm above the heart. She was successfully operated on by our, our world-class uh, aortic uh, surgeon. So that can, and uh, did fun, the pregnancy uh, you know, worked out fine, but that, that's not something to recommend. Uh, this is, shows another application in a VEDS uh, patient uh, looking at the one of the, the superficial femoral artery. This is one of the arteries going down to the leg. Uh, this is showing the vessel going across uh, from right to left, flow heading down towards the, the knee and, and lower leg. And you can see, again, there's a median strip in it. This is something one t sees if there is a dissection. Uh, and here, when we ro if we rotate the probe so we get a cross-sectional slice through here, you can see that there are two separate areas of flow separated by uh, the dissection flap. So ultrasound can be a useful technique in some areas uh, for some purposes. Uh, now, magnetic resonance angiography is a extremely powerful and useful technique under some circumstances. Uh, it is similar to computed tomographic or CT angiography in being able to visualize all arteries. It uses a form of contrast that does not, uh, it has much less uh, risk of side effects than CT dye, though not abs but not absolutely zero. And it does not use ionizing radiation. So if one is going to visualize arterial segments at six or 12 or 24 month intervals for years or decades or many decades, uh, this is a significant advantage uh, to using uh, magnetic magnetic resonance angiography. However, this is something that's done well in major uh, referral centers, large hospitals, and may or may not be done well in smaller hospitals or other settings. So it's not uh, as available as some of the other techniques. Uh, this is an example of the top two pictures of magnetic resonance uh, angiograms of arteries going to the head. Uh, the arteries on the outside here are the carotid arteries and then the vertebral arteries that go to the front of the head and then go up into the brain. And these are the, where the vertebral arteries come up to go to the back part of the brain. And we can see that the carotid artery on the right side uh, is almost completely uh, uh, you know, absent. It's not showing any flow here. There's a dissection in this area. And the left uh, carotid artery is very kinked and tortuous and uh, this looks abnormal. Uh, ten months later, another magnetic resonance angiogram is done. And here we can see that there are lots of little channels we call collaterals that have formed around this area where there didn't seem to be any flow, restoring flow on the right side. And you can see a linear uh, uh, structure here, which shows that there is, and, and probably at this time was a, uh, this is taken from a slightly different angle, a dissection flap in the left common carotid, uh, in the left carotid artery here. Uh, and these dissection flaps, uh, you know, are common, some, and sometimes they heal over time. So to summarize, uh, the, there's 
uh, there are a variety of available modalities and what is best for a given patient in a given situation uh, depends on uh, what the situation is. Computed tomographic angiography visualizes all arteries and it detects leaks with great sensitivity, which is extremely important at times. It does involve radiation and x-ray contrast that may cause allergic reactions or have adverse effects on the kidneys. MRI also visualizes all arteries, does not involve radiation, and uses very low but not zero risk contrast. It does not visualize leaks, and it is less widely available and does entail people needing to get for a prolonged exam into a uh, machine that uh, generates a lot of noise and makes some people feel claustrophobic. Uh, echocardiography and arterial ultrasound uh, visualizes uh, much of the aorta, its branches in the abdomen and arteries going towards the brain that are not shadowed by bone, lung, air. Uh, it doesn't involve radiation or dye. is widely available. Uh, it does not visualize small leaks and depends on a high level of expertise. So again, uh, like MRA being performed in major centers, this is something that is more reliably well done in, in major centers. Invasive angiography has been around the longest. It's tried and true. And if one may uh, need to or want to do a uh, transcatheter intervention, it is the technique of choice. Uh, but uh, moving a at least somewhat stiff catheter within a potentially fragile artery does entail a risk of arterial dissection or rupture. Uh, and so high-level expertise and very careful uh, uh, you know, consideration of whether uh, their, the benefits will outweigh the risks are necessary, and doing it in a center with high expertise is especially important. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I and Dr. Connolly would be uh, d delighted to take questions or comments that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Devereaux, for preparing that presentation. I am going to go ahead and start my video back up, and I think uh, we'll get Dr. Devereaux back on video as well. Dr. Connolly is already on. And we did, we did have some questions pop into the box uh, during, during that, so that's very great. And I have some pretty common questions that uh, I would like to ask as well. So if so I guess I'll just start right with the Q&A then. <laughs> um, if a person already has two carotid stents, would a CT scan be a better option for monitoring or instead of spending prolonged periods of time in an MRI machine? Is there a difference there for the MRI machine when there's existing stents inside the arteries? Well, I think they're both, both the CT angiogram and the MR angiogram are very good techniques. And so uh, for many of my patients would rather have a CT angiogram uh, for any individual time they're being studied because it's a much shorter uh, test uh, to do and, and uh, they can go often uh, may be able to go to a place nearer where they live than coming to a major center that's going to do the MR angiogram right. On the other hand, if uh, someone has something that may need to be imaged you know, every six months or a year for the next 30 or 40 years, uh, then uh, you know there is a risk, it's not terribly high, but it's not zero of uh, you know, causing cancer. If you're uh, looking, imaging the neck, the thyroid is there and it's a, a potential target for radiation induced cancers. Uh, the chest, uh, when, you know, there, there are measurable increases in lung or breast cancer in people who've had many, many uh, CAT scans over the years. So people have to balance that out in terms of uh, the, the, what risk and frustrations, how they balance out for the individual, and listen to the 
the, their physicians in terms of if there's any difference in expertise in performance of the MR angiogram or and skill in interpreting of the, well, the interpretation of the two tests if there are complicated things. People who've had uh, stents in place, the imaging may be a little more complicated. Uh, some of these chronic dissections is, is complicated are complicated to review and having people who are experienced at it. So if, if the MR people are better that you know, re interpreting complicated images, then maybe good to, you know, spend your extra 45 minutes in an MR scanner and go some extra miles. If the CT scanner people are, are better, then that uh, opts for that, even if there's some more radiation risk. Thank you. Dr. Connolly, do you want to add anything to that one? Or would you like to switch off on questions or how? I guess we didn't talk about how we wanted to do this beforehand. I, I uh, think Dr. Devereaux answered it uh, perfectly. And, you know, I've had similar experience where there's some patients that really don't like the MR, the time, uh, and also claustrophobia. And so that sometimes is the stepping stone to decide one imaging modality or another. At our institution, also, if a patient with VEDS or uh, Lois Dietz or Marfan syndrome needs multiple imaging procedures, we are limited to doing one MRI on a body part per day. So you can do head and neck together, but you can't do head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis. At our institution, it may be different at different centers. Um, and so that may be um, a decision point where the patient says, let's do MRI of the head and neck and CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, that sort of thing. So, but I think he outlined it really, you know, very elegantly, the pros and cons of different imaging tools. And it's really a, uh, what we call team-based care, making a decision with your team, what works best for the patient and the imaging folks and the individuals who are managing the patient, either surgeons or uh, medical professionals, really. I think that that's the key thing. Thank you. And I think this leads right into the next question. You mentioned having you know, your full body scanned and doing different scans in different places if you need to. Um, for somebody who has VEDS and has routine scans on the abdominal area and the head and neck to monitor existing aneurysms, should they also be having a full body scan to check for new aneurysms and how often would you recommend those? Do you want to start this one, Heidi? Sure, I'd be happy to. And then you can we clean can up. Ping pong back and forth. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it's tricky. Um, it, I personally recommend full imaging at the time of my initial evaluation um, for of a patient who has uh, either a new diagnosis or known uh, vascular EDS. Um, and then I ask patients to be my partner if they notice something new, um, let's say in a vessel in the arm or in the leg, um, uh, they might notice it before we pick it up. We have certain select positions where we notice arterial or feel the pulse and notice the arteries um, during a physical exam. But obviously we can't evaluate every blood vessel in the body by our physical exam. So my sort of uh, plan is to do an initial evaluation of all of the blood vessels and then do select imaging following that. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it varies, I guess, with a specific patient and and uh, and their specific concern. Dick, how about you? No, I, I would agree with that. And uh, I, you know, I mean, more of my patients have Marfan syndrome than have VEDS. And what I try to do there is to do, uh, you know, MRAs or if they if they haven't had uh, surgery or not approaching surgery, do MRAs to look at the uh, the full aorta down into the iliac arteries and the beginning of the neck vessels. Uh, and then if we, if the results are, when I, when, I, when I see someone initially, if the results are similar to what we get in our, in our lab, uh, between Mary Roman and myself, we follow 500 or so patients with genetic aortopathies since we're the two senior uh, faculty in the echo lab. Uh, We've uh, beaten all the sonographers into being used to looking at 
all segments of the aorta. So if we get very similar results to the MRA, then I would use echo, you know, on every six months or every year, depending on the findings, and maybe in five years do a whole MRA survey again. And I, I suspect strategies uh, somewhat similar to that uh, are, you know, would be applicable to, to VEDS patients where one would look less frequently at areas where everything had been fine. I wouldn't let five years pass, but, uh, you know, I might not uh, do six months or one year re-imaging of everything. Thank you. And I think uh, both of you bring really good points to that. So I really appreciate um, that answer. For Let's see. Do you have any numbers? We talked about how invasive angiography procedures can cause dissections and ruptures in patients with beds. Do you happen to have any numbers on um, how, how many invasive angiography procedures cause complications or ruptures or any kind of statistics? Or in what cases would you say that the benefits outweigh the risks? It's kind of a loaded question. Well, it's, a, it's particularly a loaded question because the uh, literature on, uh, to some extent, the, 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 much of the literature on VED centers around patients who were identified because of complications. And uh, you can't use that as a basis uh, for deciding how likely complications are. It's like uh, cardiac, cardi cardiothoracic surgeons uh, operate on patients who have aortic dissections, and there are some patients with aortic dissections who have relatively normal-sized aortas. Uh, so they worry very much about wanting to operate early in the course of aortic enlargement. They don't see the vast number of people in the population with mildly dilated aortas. So uh, you, you can't go from series of complications back to sort of sort out the, the risks. Uh, so the, some of the reports in the literature have high rates of complications, but that's because selection, there's a lot of selection of people who came in with uh, something urgent going on, had a emergency, had emergency angiograms, not necessarily done in the centers most experienced with uh, uh, genetic arterial diseases. And uh, nobody, the answer is nobody has really good figures from large numbers of people who've been identified uh, prospectively and then tracked down all of the invasive angiograms they had and the results of it and what kind of centers they were done in. If somebody had uh, the, the a few spare years uh, to track down everybody in, in the series of 1,200 plus patients with collagen diagnoses in Peter Byers' lab and get uh, was able to get all of their medical records, they could put together an answer to that question. I'm sure that the proportion of uh, invasive arteriograms that lead to complications is lower than what's available in the, in the literature because it's biased towards uh, uh, misadventures, uh, but it's still uh, undoubtedly you know, considerably higher than the, the rates of, of major uh, causing heart attack of stroke of one in 500 with coronary arteriography and, you know, small low rates of uh, dissections, many of which are uh, in, in the general population, many of which are very localized and can be definitively treated by a single stent. Uh, uh, but it's, but it's, you know, with VEDS, it's, it's uh, appreciably higher. I don't know if, Heidi, if you have uh, numbers that you can really trust that, that I would love to hear if you do. No, I think that, you know, if we have a patient with VEDS uh, or another disorder who needs an invasive procedure, obviously we choose the most experienced individual, but there's an increased risk. And I don't think anybody can give you an exact number. Is it um, one in 10? Is it one in 20? Is it one in 100? Is it one in 500? I don't know that anybody can say that. So exactly for the reasons that you outlined, Dick. Yeah, I have one of our interventionalists who's 
done, uh, you know, coronary angiography or other catheter procedures on probably at least 40 of my Marfan patients. And so, you know, he's, he's used to being gentle there. There are different arterial properties, but he's used to being very gentle in, in uh, people with arterial uh, diseases. And uh, we had one, one stented coronary dissection and, uh, you know, not, not a sky high rate, but certainly not zero. Thank you. And is there a certain scenario in which you would say that the, you know, obviously we approach it very cautiously in patients with beds, unless it's done in an expert center and even then so. In what case would that risk outweigh, or the benefit outweigh the risk, I mean, in an emergency, I guess? Well, I mean, there are situations where people are coming in with a, you know, an acute heart attack that looks like it's uh, affecting a large amount of the heart muscle where there is appreciable mortality and high risk of long-term disability from, you know, knocking out half of the heart muscle that, uh, uh, you know, an excellent and intense interventionalist going in and, and uh, doing an intervention to get rid of the obstructing clot or to stand a, a dissection that is causing the the infarction could save a lot of heart muscle. So there, there are big gains that would, would way outweigh the uh, potential risk. And if there's someone who's having a leaking aneurysm somewhere and there's not a team that is uh, highly expert in doing you know, open uh, arterial repair, uh, then doing an endovascular intervention uh, is likely to be life-saving. And, and uh, extremely important. One of the things that's happening, the, the, the good news for patients who don't have genetic arteriopathies is that many of their arterial abnormalities can be treated by transcatheter techniques. Uh, the bad news that flows from that is that uh, small to medium volume uh, uh, arterial or vascular surgery programs are increasingly doing most, if not all, of their procedures by catheter-based techniques. And so people being trained in vascular surgery or uh, as cardiac surgeons doing uh, some, you know, doing aortic surgery are getting uh, less and less experience or no experience in doing open operations so that uh, uh, surgeons in an increasing number of institutions either never were trained or were adequately trained, but haven't done much in the last 10 or 15 years and are exceedingly rusty. Uh, so that uh, they're, they're not necessarily prepared to do optimal open surgery uh, with relatively low risk. That's why where, you know, if patients can get sent to the Mayo Clinic or Cornell or Hopkins or Stanford or you know, Baylor or the, the, the centers that see lots and lots of people with genetic arteriopathies, they're, 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 they're comprising a higher percentage of open major vascular procedures and the centers that see a lot of people with genetic diseases are keeping their skills right up at the top. So there's a, there's a bigger difference than there would have been 10 or 15 years ago among centers in terms of doing open, uh, open surgery. That may push uh, in emergent or semi-emergent situations towards doing endovascular interventions, even if there may be downstream complications that you know, may be best tidied up in a, in a major center. Thank you. And I think we're getting a lot of questions about um, the radiation with CTs again. So I'd like to, to go back to, to that one. You've mentioned that uh, CTs, you know, if you need a lot of them, it may be better to consider an MRA. Um, what would you consider a lot of CTs? One person says they've had seven over nine months. And do they need to be more concerned about this? than I think their care team has been. If, if there's a specific reason, the, the risks per CT scan are very, very low. One of the best studies, actually, I think it mostly used chest x-rays because they're much, much more common. Uh, and it required the population of Toronto, of Ontario, 16 million people uh, with their medical records over a decade or more 
uh, to be able to show that there was an increased risk of breast cancer with the radiation. So uh, it's there, it's real, it's measurable if you have enough data, but it's, but it's very, very low. So if uh, any individual CT scan, if there's a good reason for doing it, whether it's a risk of dissection or rupture, or whether there are this limited diagnostic ability, uh, you know, limited quality of uh, the MRA scans, or someone gets claustrophobic and freaks out halfway through the MR scans and can't complete them so you don't get a good study or whatever, then the, it's a no-brainer that the CT scan is the right thing to do. And the vast majority of people who have lots and lots of CT scans, dozens of CT scans over the course of, of decades, maybe many decades, will never develop a cancer that they wouldn't have otherwise. But it is something when you look at millions of people and their exposure to radiation, it is measurable. It's not zero. Uh, it's uh, uh, almost certainly lower than the risk of having and using a driver's license. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Connolly, did you want to add anything to that one? I think um, uh, Dick answered it uh, very, very well. And, and it's the same as we discussed before, what's the risk versus the benefit? Um, and so I think using the right imaging uh, for the right patient at the right time is so critical. And there are some techniques that our radiologists can use to fine tune uh, the imaging study and to localize the area that's imaged, and that can decrease the amount of radiation significantly. Um, and so I think, you know, using an individualized approach is just critically important. Yeah, and one thing is that because of the ability of CT scan to detect any leak of blood outside the order or other vessels, uh, surgeons tend to be used to using CT scans and are very comfortable looking at them. Uh, we do a lot of both clinical and research work with uh, cardi cardiac and, and arterial magnetic resonance angiography at Cornell, and we've gotten Len Girardi to be very used to looking at MR scans and to be happy to substitute them for surveillance uh, uh, CT scans. So uh, any place where, where surgeons can get uh, enough of an initiation to MRA, then they will uh, feel more comfortable being able to look at the images themselves. Uh, one of the things that with both uh, CT scans and MRAs, if they're read by radiologists, is there's a ten, the radiologists tend to have a very strong focus on making measurements in a way that are, can be reproducible uh, from year to year and from radiologist to radiologist and institution to institution. So they pick very specific places in each segment of the aorta to measure. And so, uh, whereas cardiologists, when we look at uh, the aorta, we look for the biggest correctly measured portion of any segment because physiologically that's most important. We may not, uh, so the radiologists sometimes get uh, focus on, on areas that are not what is clinically of most interest in terms of where they make the measurements. So that we're at Cornell, we're fortunate that the, uh, the director of, of the uh, cardiac CT program uh, is, uh, has radiology training, but did her internal medicine at Cornell and cardiology training at UCSF. And the head of uh, the, the, the cardiac MR program is a cardiologist with a joint appointment in radiology. So we merge uh, the advantages of both, both disciplines. And I'm sure the Mayo Clinic has a you know, strongly interactive uh, uh, arrangement that, that yields similar advantages. But, but some places you get CT scans and they, they, just, they, they measure things at the midpoint of the right pulmonary artery. And, and that's what, the only thing that counts in the ascending or descending aorta. And then you look at the pictures and say, oh my gosh, you know, there's, there's something you know, more somewhere else. And, so that leads me to actually my question, which is not in the Q&A. For someone monitoring a known aneurysm, um, is there a difference or a benefit in sticking with one modality versus another? Like, is there any harm going back and forth between 
a CTA and an MRA for a known issue? Was it harder to keep track of it or? Uh, we, uh, my experience is that if uh, people, uh, certainly within our institution, if the people who are, uh, you know, highly experienced with looking at whether it's echocardiogram, CT scans, or MR studies tend to get relatively similar uh, measurements. There can be differences in the uh, uh, imaging conventions that are used, and this has been kicked around in terms of uh, the echocardiography has had a uh, standard approach. Adult echocardiography has had a standard approach to how to make measurements uh, since 1977. And so when we looked in the multi-center GENTAC registry, which was a NIH-sponsored uh, multi-center registry of patients with genetically associated uh, aortic conditions, there was a very high degree of agreement of the measurements in different areas of the aorta from the, the, all the different echo labs compared to a, a core lab. The, there's been less standardization uh, and I don't think there's yet a single uh, standard that everyone agrees on for how to measure diameters uh, for MR CT scans. And so uh, there, in that uh, uh, internal study in, in you know, a couple thousand people with aortic conditions, there was good but not nearly as tight agreement uh, uh, between the, the readings from the various centers and the uh, the, the, the core lab. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, change, switch back and forth from CT to MR to, to ECHO and we get, you know, similar, relatively similar measurements. One thing that I keep telling my patients, so they, they think I'm probably a broken record with a scratch, but uh, is that the aorta is not a rigid pipe. It has some elasticity. In fact, part of the, per the function of the aorta is to uh, stretch every time the heart beats so that part of the blood that's pumped out goes into the aorta uh, and then after the heartbeat is finished, that aorta springs back and pushes the blood forward. So the size of the aorta and to a lesser extent the size of other arteries can be influenced by the blood pressure at the moment when the pictures are taken. And blood pressure can bounce around from minute to minute uh, and we, we, all, we always get a measurement blood pressure right before or right after the echocardiogram, but we have no idea what the pressure was at the time when we get the, the best pictures. So if I measure echocardiograms done by the same sonographer on the same patient with where nothing is going on over the years, we often see one or two millimeter fluctuations from time to time in my measurements. And so, you know, some degree of variation, some of it is maybe between methods, between observers, some of it's physiological, that the blood pressure is a, a variable we're not able to control. And uh, I once did a study where we measured blood pressure every minute for 20 minutes before and after we gave patients nitroglycerin under the tongue. And it drove the patients nuts, it drove the sonographer nuts to have me there blowing up the blood pressure cuff every minute and saying, record the echo again. And so, so we swore off that one ever, ever since that study. So we, we just don't really know what the blood pressure is at the moment when we make a measurement. Most CT scans and MR scans, they don't, they don't even measure the blood pressure around the time of the study. So they, they have no idea where the blood pressure is. Very interesting. That's, that's fascinating because we do see this like static image when we get the result and we forget that it's not a static vessel. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. Yeah, and we're looking at what, what the effect is on downstream vessels of replacing the uh, somewhat elastic aorta near the heart with rigid grafts so that uh, there, there, may be, there may be consequences uh, of uh, you know not having that elasticity. Yeah. So the next question um, for patients who have a lot of coils from previous embolizations, are MRAs still safe for them at that point? 
Heidi, do you want to take this? Or? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. And I think in most circumstances, they are safe. Um, so many patients get embolizations, let's say in a neck vessel or another blood vessel, and they can have MRAs. It's uh, one of the questions is whether the MRA gives the imaging information that is required because with metal, there's a lot of artifact that is that sometimes the images that you want of the blood vessel that has been treated is difficult to interpret because of the metal artifact. So, um, so the short answer is yes, you can have an MRA in most circumstances because they use special material that's MR safe. Um, but the challenge is that it may not be the best imaging tool because of the uh, metal artifact. Yeah, and there used to be, uh, you know, stainless steel clips used sometimes with vascular surgery. But that uh, that ended uh, by sometime probably in the very early 1980s. We had we had one of my Lois Dietz patients uh, where we couldn't uh, uh, find out uh, the what the 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 nature of the whether of the clips that he'd had during. Uh, uh, surgery, though I think eventually uh, at the University of Washington after he moved to Seattle, he had some MRAs and nothing more happened, though by that point he'd had multiple operations and lots of scar tissue that probably would have uh, uh, kept anything, anything that was tugged couldn't go anywhere anyway, so that uh, we don't know, can't use that as a documentation of safety, but the, the, the clips that could be adversely affected went out you know, now close to 40 years ago. And that actually, you mentioned scar tissue, which brings us right into our next question. Uh, does scar tissue prevent a good view of the arteries when using ultrasound? I'm sorry, I, I had a little bit of uh, the loudspeaker at this end didn't work quite right. No problem. So the question was, if the scar tissue prevent a good image of an artery using ultrasound? Oh, no, the scar tissue generally doesn't uh, affect ultrasonic imaging. It's the, what, what affects ultrasound imaging is if there's a, uh, a, a transition from uh, tissue to air or tissue to bone uh, that will reflect most of the ultrasound, so not enough gets through to see things on the other side of it. So scar tissue has about, what drives the differences in tissues uh, as far as ultrasound is concerned is how dense they are. And the density of scar tissue is not very different from the density of muscle or fat, so that uh, you, you may get a little bit more of the uh, you know, the ultrasound reflected and get what we call acoustic shadowing, but it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge problem at all. Yeah, the one uh, issue is if there's calcium in the scar tissue. Um, sometimes there's healing um, and in the healing calcium forms. And again, if there's calcium, just like Dick said, bone is calcium. And so if there's calcium in the healing process, then it can uh, cause some, ab some difficulty with ultrasound. Yeah. What I've seen most of the problem has been in people who've had thoracoabdominal uh, repairs and they have, you know, a fair amount of scar tissue, but they, what it also happens with their scarring is that intestine is pulled up into unusual uh, orientations. And so much of the problem is actually probably from air in, in loops of intestine that are stuck up against the anterior abdominal wall and the diaphragm in places that they wouldn't be if someone hadn't had the surgery. So I've at least always thought that that was mostly not an issue from the scar tissue, but, but really from air in the, in the intestines. Okay, thank you. And I think, um, you know, we talked a lot about echo, MRA, and CTA, and some about invasive angiography. Is there any place for x-ray in looking at arteries? Chest x-ray can be used to give you a sort of a ballpark view of the aorta, the largest blood vessel in the body, but really otherwise uh, x-ray is rarely used to look at blood vessels. It's not, it doesn't give us enough detail. 
On the other hand, x-rays are used frequently in VEDS patients, let's say if they present with chest pain and you're worried about a pneumothorax, a chest x-ray is a great way to make the diagnosis of a pneumothorax. It would be the first and best test to do initially. You can make that diagnosis with a CT scan, um, but a chest x-ray will make that diagnosis easily. So, but for blood vessel detail, x-ray, just a plain x-ray, yeah, the only times it'll, it'll really show things is if there's a lot of calcification in the vessel walls. And then if, if you find enough calcification to be able to, to, to see the arteries uh, clearly, uh, you know, the, 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 the CT surgeons will say, oh my God, you know, that's a hostile aorta or a hostile whatever artery that they don't want to operate on. Uh, one thing the, the the, the uh, pro probably about as high a proportion of VEDS patients as Marfan patients do have pneumothorax. Uh, our experience when we looked at it, you know, when we had a couple hundred Marfan patients was about seven and a half percent. So a decided minority, but mu much, much more frequent than in the general population. And one of the tricks, if, you, if someone has symptoms suggestive of a pneumothorax in a place where people are not real used to, to you know, people with these conditions, the chest x-ray usually is two pictures, but there should be a third picture of uh, looking from front to back when someone has breathed out as much as they, as they can. Because when the uh, chest is smaller, the, uh, the air gets, uh, uh, the, the lung gets smaller and the, the place where the air is gets thicker and it becomes easier to see. So they want to, you get, need to get an expiration chest x-ray. Uh, when one is suspicious of, of pneumothorax. And you know, I, teach, I, I, I burden my patients with a lot of information about their conditions because with the, with the Marsan syndrome affecting one person in five to 10,000 and VEDS may be affecting one person in 50,000, the chances are that most doctors or other health professionals that someone will see may never have seen someone with the condition or someone they recognize as having the condition. Uh, so that uh, the, the, the health care of patients with these conditions is uh, dramatically benefited uh, by their being prepared to serve as patient educators uh, to bring you know, both knowledge of their condition and their knowledge of aspects of the condition uh, to the medical venues that where there where that are not in centers that that see genetic uh, cardiovascular conditions all the time. And I think um, we is right about time. So um, I really appreciate all of your answers to these questions. I think I had one follow up question from our last one about X-rays. So if a patient with VEDS goes to an emergency room and they only give them an x-ray, should they be, and it doesn't show anything like a lung collapse. Would you say that further imaging is needed or is depending on the situation? It depends on what they're going to the, uh, to the emergency room about. So if, it, if there's uh, you know, pain or something else that suggests a vascular event, then uh, even if it seems to, if the symptoms settle down, you know, I would uh, send, if it was one of my patients, they came, said I, I'd gone to an emergency room and they just did a chest x-ray and sent me home last week and I'm feeling okay, but I had pain in this area, some area, particular area of the body, I would generally, you know, have a semi-elective or semi-urgent you know, follow-up imaging just to make sure. Uh, but there are lots of things. Having VEDS doesn't protect people from having, you know, muscle sprains and, and GI upsets and, you know, all sorts of other things that can give rise to pain or discomfort. So the, the key thing is if, if there's something that it, you know, it's perfectly obvious that, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know, uh, there's a sore muscle and moving the shoulder, you know, makes it a certain way makes it hurt and, you know, not moving it, the pain goes completely away, then that's, you know, you know, maybe one chance in a million to, to pad the odds of that being a vascular event, uh, you know, so that it, re it really depends on what the, 
the reason for it is. But if it's anything that could be vascular, but probably wasn't, I, I tend to you know believe in better safe than sorry. And I would agree. I agree with Dick. I think one thing that I've learned um, is that if somebody is sick enough that they need to go to the emergency department, nobody wants to go to an emergency department, but if they're sick enough that they go to an emergency department, then usually additional testing more than just a chest, Let's, particularly if they have chest pain, more than uh, just a chest x-ray is warranted. Thank you. And I think it is very important that everybody be prepared in an emergency. And I, I really appreciate all of your expertise tonight and helping us get some of these questions answered. So thank you so much for both of, both of you for your time tonight. And um, if your question was not answered, uh, please don't fear. You can submit them to our Help and Resource Center at marcan.org slash e3ask. We are experiencing a high volume of questions right now, so it might take a little bit longer than normal to get to your question, but we will do our best to answer your question as soon as we can. Again, if you can complete the session survey and let us know how we did, that would be really wonderful, and we are excited to be bringing all of these sessions and connections with community through the Whova app. So if you are in the Whova app, you can connect with community, you can do all sorts of things in there and we have another week and a half of sessions. So if you could share your experience on social media as well, use the hashtag E3Summit20 and we can follow that hashtag. And if you'd like to help us make more programming possible, you can do that at morefan.org slash donate. Again, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you Dr. Connolly and Dr. Devereaux for joining us tonight as well. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Everyone have a wonderful night. And you too. Great. Okay.